there are problems, please ask uh, us to be on. Cassettes 100 was uh, restaged for suddenly turning visible um, like art and architecture from Southeast Asia, 1969 to 1989. Part of our efforts for that exhibition is to focus on artists uh, and artworks that were featured at the Alpha Gallery in Singapore, PRC Institute of Modern Art in Bangkok, and the Cultural Centre of the Philippines uh, in Manila. And we restaged the work because the work was first premiered uh, at the CCP uh, in 1971. Um, at the time. Who doesn't know what a cassette is? Who's so... Everybody knows what a cassette is. Well, it's this uh, little implement that comes from another planet and it has to tape inside <laughs> and put it inside. And it was invented in the 70s, but now, uh, since we couldn't find cassettes, we refurbished the recordings on MP3 and they will be played here in this cassette-like looking... cassette-looking like implements, okay? Oh yeah, my name is Jonas Baez uh, from the Philippines. I'm a composer and ethnomusicologist. I studied at the University of the Philippines with Jose Maceda and Ramon Santos and in Freiburg Music Hochschule. I didn't know how to approach it at first because I wasn't, I was a kid in 1971, I never knew about this. So I, I asked for the music score, I studied it and having known how Maceda thought conceptually with regards to the, the conflation between performers, these big numbers, and the soundscape. I knew exactly that in those 10 groups, th those 10 groups alluded to a social structure somehow. So I said, that will be my approach in refurbishing this, uh, remounting this work. I need 10 very good leaders whom I will give a workshop with, who will know the equipment, who will know the music somehow, and with whom I could work with one choreographer or two choreographers. I had, I had two, but they were working as a team. To assume that these leaders, these 10 people, will know by heart everything that has to do with the movement and then at that time I was expecting participants as walk-ins and they could just follow the leader. That was a simple and it was, it was actually, I felt so much Maceda's uh, thinking at that time. So when we did that, it alluded so much to how uh, these little, uh, little groups as little pocket uh, communities which, which come together and, and it was really very fascinating how things turned out uh, how sound actually uh, reverberated the, the way people were connecting to each other. I tried very much to, to talk to him at times, if there was any chance. But uh, it was in 1981 when he uh, sort of asked for my help and a colleague's help to write down his big score called the Aruding of 1981 that I really got to understood what was the very essence of his creation, of his creative process, what was beyond what we hear. So that was how I understood him, little by little. And in 1983, I was so lucky 
that while I did my initial studies with, of the music of the Iraya Mangyan in Mindoro, he accepted me as a student in composition. And I did like two compositions with him, major works, uh, in his style of course, because that was my icon. And uh, from then on I got to know how to deal with the music. When I see the score, I understand it. I understand what he wants to say because I had studied with him closely and we have discussed. Towards the end of his life, I spent most of my Tuesdays in his house and to talk endlessly about music and society and, and political, econo political economy and culture and all that stuff. Eric? I think an invitation to do something is always um, exciting. Um, I was curious to know what the piece was first, um, and that you know, having said like it was 100 cassettes, and to deal with 100 performers, um, that's one of my biggest uh, casts that I would have actually choreographed itself. So I was quite interested to see how we can restage history, um, you know, or rather look at a piece that can be. Um, ageless itself, you know. That was my first reaction. Uh, what really excited me was when Jonas showed me the original score. Uh, you know, the score was really huge and there was like pages of it and there was like little scribblings of score and uh, musical notes itself. And when I saw that, an image of um, a kind of bees or communities of people coming together, like grains of sand, you know. Um, so I, that was really quite a very visual, impactful moment for me. This thing to produce Cassettes 100 uh, came to me, <laughs> this would be weird, but it came to me in a dream. Uh, when Maceda passed away, I found it strange that sometimes I dream about him. Sometime in 2015, I was just thinking of uh, uh, things outside Maceda. Um, all of a sudden I dreamt about him again and somehow he told me in the dream I'm going to be a hundred and he was smiling this big smile of his and I said and I said yes Lolo in the dream when I woke up I remembered that 2017 was to be centennial and I said there's a piece that's appropriate for that it's called cassettes 100 because 100 years old, cassettes 100. Uh, so I, I brought up the idea at the Center for Ethnomusicology. But of course, the first thing that would be that, that we have the, the reality that the, perhaps the center had to face was that we couldn't do this in cassettes anymore because we don't have these machines. If we could find volunteers with the machines, but we need 100. And we have to refurbish the tapes until we tried every idea of let's do it on phones, let's do it here, etc, etc. And finally, uh, David was able to find this uh, very cheap MP3 player, which we buy in uh, this cheap uh, um, store in Manila. And when we found it, and I said that this will work very much, I said, you buy five, let's try five tracks. And I was so happy with the sound. I was so concerned with the sound. And I said, Get, get us a hundred of these. And so to make the story short, we were able to, to mount it in, in uh, 2017, uh, the day after his birthday, so February 1, in, at the Vargas Museum in, in, in UP. We had very small space. And so I said, we have to do this again. And they suggested to do it in September in, at the Cultural Center where it was first performed. A lot of reflection. Um, I spent a lot of time listening to the piece. Um, I didn't want to form a set score or something like that, right? Um, I, think the, I think one of the most important things that I did was actually spend time in the atrium, just sitting down and walking around and getting the sense of the space itself. Um, when I listened to the score, I knew I wanted 
people, masses of people coming together, you know, um, people holding um, at different points in, in, in the gallery and, and roaming around and, and saying, you know, come, come, let's come together, you know, because I think the idea for me was not so much about the presentation. The question I had was, how do I work collaboratively uh, with all these people coming together? Um, how can we form community? Because I'm a strong believer that art can build communities. I think as a producer, um, I immediately foresaw the challenge that would come with organising a programme like this uh, because it has 100 people and I like to think 100 people as 100 agents of chaos and so I definitely knew that we had to be really prepared for receiving all of the 100 people and I think um, one of the clear directions that we had from the director was to recruit 10 people first, 10 intelligent people who could function as the leaders and I knew um, from discussions with the team as well that we wanted to have 10 people who could represent a diverse range of disciplines as well. You know, people who are both artists and art lovers and art enthusiasts, people who are dancers, who are writers and who are everything in between as well. So I think that was something that I was quite eager to undertake. And then um, recruiting the additional 90 people as well was very interesting uh, because I also wanted to make sure that we had a diverse group of people. So we had. Um, people who were like practically children, we had people who were, you know, senior citizens and of, again we had artists, art lovers, art enthusiasts, the whole gamut all represented in the 100 people. So I think that was really an interesting thing to see unfold. Okay, are they all on? Turn them on. Go. Just go on, go on, go on. Anna likes performing arts. She has been doing it for Down Syndrome Association, uh, for the various events and also her school. So we thought that it would be great if uh, we can do it at a national level. Singapore is a very fast-paced environment, but, but through this um, experience that we had, you know, whereby we have to we hear the different sounds, you know, the sounds of nature, of jungle, and, and I think it's good that every movement we make, we, we are reflecting on it. And then at the same time, um, as, as we stop at each level, we, we think and, and this is the time for us to actually slow down, to, to actually think of what we have done and to reflect on it instead of rushing all over like what we have been doing. So I think it's a, a it's a great it's a great experience for both myself and my daughter. Power for more impact. When you move it a bit, but it has to be more. You know, you know, you, you push back. I love the work that he did as an ethnomusicologist and how he he archived all of the indigenous sounds and from that archive he abstracted it. Uh, yeah, and I just I I love that he brought his field work with the, with the indigenous people and he built a relationship with them and then he brought their voices into his work. Uh, I had questions about, you know, like, uh how um, a, like how Jose Masida is like is situated within the Filipino art world during that during that time, and because also um, because he uses a lot of like audio clips that are very much based on uh, Filipino uh, indigenous practices. So I also want, wanted to know if like was it like a specific what, did it have did Jose Masida um, have a specific reason why why he decided to do that. Or is it a matter of like again recycling of the otherness of like indigenous indigenous uh, people for your own like for your own artistic practice, which is also debatable as well.
every region and every um, culture has its own um, profile of sounds, whether it be you know, music or whether it be the noises that you hear in whatever environment that um, you live in and that you hear on a daily basis. The, these soundscapes are something that uh, is unique to every individual person and to hear what is someone else's soundscape or perhaps, you know, a regional soundscape to cap that captures um, the, the Philippines and, you know, very much um, other parts of Southeast Asia where there are certain similarities. I think that is something very special in building a regional identity for us, especially in Singapore where I feel like our national identity can be a little bit dispersed and can be a little bit, um, it's not as rooted just because we are such a young nation. My favorite part is the um, unveiling of the scrolls and on it, it has uh, writing to do with aspects of identity and I find that that uh, resonates with uh, many, many cultures. So I think there are similarities uh, between Philippines and Singapore in terms of um, trying to find you know, a, a place, sort of like place making in this whole realm of um, what it means to be uh, to be a unique identity. I think what was uh, fantastic about the work and the fact that we collaborated um, from, the, from the beginning with um, a local choreographer like Elizabeth De Rosa but also having the participants be mostly local was that it automatically made it relevant to Singaporeans and Singapore audiences. I think my perception that it would be very much uh, Filipino in, in flavour was actually proven wrong when I saw how, my, how the participants adapted to it, how it fit very nicely in the space that we have, how I think um, our two nations have you know, trajectories of histories that dealt with similar issues of colonialism and uh, different communities coming together. Uh, I think those kinds of themes transcended um, the geography and the time as well.